What's up, Stokers of Wellness and Health Nation? Uh, this is Marin from Marin Lazy Podcast. Uh, legends, just before we start again, I just want to remind you that this pod is brought to you by TRX Training Sydney. Uh, we're doing Zoom workouts on the straps and some kettlebell action. If you want your shoulders squared and your lats flared, uh, head to trxtrainingsydney.com, check out the website, hit me up with an email and we'll take you through a basic use of straps and a bit of a workout and then we might let you in the class so you can join in with the rest of the Stoke Nations. Um, oh, and on that as well, you're going to have amazing core which is kind of fitting because on today's pod, we talk about with Dr. Stuart McGill. Now, Dr. Stuart McGill is a retired professor. He's best known for his work um, to do with lower back pain. He's wrote a number of books about it and also core training. Uh, We discuss a lot regarding um, the best ways to kind of train your core, what to do, what not to do, athletes with best core, yeah, uh, a bit of sleep action, recovery, breath work. So it was an interesting chat. So I uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, let's get into it. Oh, one more thing. Um, in the pod, we do use some big words. Well, I think they're big words. We refer a lot to proximal stability. Uh, for those that just want to keep it simple, all that means is uh, keeping your core tight, like your midline strong or stable so your distal mobility uh, which we talk about uh, so your extremities are more mobile and produce your more power Um, i think they'll make more sense as you get in the pod but nevertheless if you have any questions please uh, go to the website and write us an email ask a question and yeah hope you enjoy it you Good afternoon, Dr. Stuart McGill. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Uh, well, good evening to you, Marin. I guess it's uh, morning in uh, Aussie, Sydney, and uh, it's evening here in Canada. And uh, what's the date today? The uh, we are, in April. Anyway, I, I think it's snowed every week the last week. We're t- uh, yeah, well, we, we're on 21st here, and uh, it's been sunny, uh, which is pretty unusual for uh, our winter. There you go. Yeah, so, um, so, uh, Sue, can you, I mean, for my audience, um, could you just give us a bit of your background and, um, yeah, tell us about you. How did you get into your craft? Well, I was a professor for over 30 years at the University of Waterloo. I'd done a PhD in spine biomechanics, so obviously I was asking questions like, how does the spine work? How does it become injured? What are the pathways to pain? What are the ways to train it, Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, The two clinics, uh, sorry, the two laboratories that I ran, one was where we measured uh, loading of tissues in real people and did trials and that sort of thing. And the second lab was one where we would take uh, cadaver spines and create the injuries so we could try and get a one-to-one match between different types of load histories and certain types of damage and pain pathways. Then uh, we started a clinic uh, just over 20 years ago. And uh, my colleagues thought I was crazy because our patient uh, assessments were two hours long. And they said, two hours, what are you going to do for two hours? And I said, well, that's the only way uh, I know that I can obtain the information I need to understand their, their history, what they've done uh, in the past, what impediments have there been to cause them to fail? You know, why are they coming us after, to us after they've seen uh, 10 or 12 uh, other clinical experts already? Uh, and then we did a curious thing. We followed up with every patient for the uh, entire history of the clinic. So with every patient, we know how they came in, their uh, patterns, uh, what we gave them to do, with their compliance, whether they did it or not, uh, whether they got better uh, or not. We did a follow-up after a year or two. Um, et cetera. So I don't know of another clinical operation that has done that kind of follow-up. 
And some of the interventions that we would uh, discover the mechanisms for in the other two labs, we would try on patients on an experimental basis. And uh, of course, we would then trial it with the patient. So it was a nice full circle. Um, uh, the one other thing as well, uh, our, uh, my laboratories and clinic were in the Department of Kinesiology. And I, I understand that particularly in Australia, I have this reputation as just being a mechanical person. But uh, I, as chair of the Department of Kinesiology, as I was for the number of years, it was made up of four subgroups, biomechanics, physiology, neuroscience, and psychosocial group. So I was responsible for representing all of them and, uh, uh, and then uh, different groups uh, would ask me to uh, consult with them, uh, industrial groups, government groups, uh, athletic teams, etc. So that's, I guess, how I got into it all. And then I retired from the uni uh, three years ago. And now I just see patients here at BackFit Pro. So the clinics is still open and working strong? Um, well, uh, in order for a person to come and see me, it, it has to only be back pain for sure. And uh, I don't see the fresh uh, back pain cases. I'm the person who I see the failures. They've already been to many experts and either failed to get better or possibly were even made worse. So what sort of people did you see in your clinic? Like, is it athletes or everyday people? Well, the, the full spectrum of society, we tend to specialize in athletes, but uh, we also see people who are really suffering. Uh, and interestingly, there's not that much difference between an elite athlete and someone that will uh, categorize at more of the fragile end of the spectrum. They're similar in that their margin for error is very, very small. When someone can hardly get out of a chair and take two steps and one wrong move and, and they will really pay for it. Uh, so so the, the, you, you have to be good to dig that person out of the hole, remove the sensitivity and build them back once again. Likewise, with an elite athlete, uh, you're so close to uh, the tipping point, uh, you can cross it for a very brief period of time. And of course, that's what peaking is doing when you're programming down to a competition. But if you keep an athlete peak, uh, of course, they'll either get sick or injured. Yeah, so you have to uh, back off and deload for a while. But it's the same principle, I guess. And uh, we've also had, uh, oh, members of royal families, top politicians, uh, celebrities from, you know, I, I guess if I said Hollywood, but, you know, television shows. And Can you movies. drop some names and any big names or? Well, there's some that have uh, gone public, uh, of course. Um, what's interesting is the more money a person makes, the, the more secret they want it because mm -hmm. they're... Uh, reputation and cachet as either a sports performer or a actor or whatever depends on their health. So they don't tell the world that they're struggling with their back. Whereas some athletes who don't make much money, uh, they're much more likely to tell their story, Olympians and uh, people like that. But if you go to BackFit Pro and just scroll down the front page, you'll see a few uh, celebrities in terms of... Uh, uh, you know, real medalist athletes and uh, some actors and, and things like that. So those people have uh, said, oh, please use my name if it will help other people and they approve it all. But no, if, if you're playing in the NBA, you don't want anybody to know that uh, you're hurt. Or, no, that, that's fair you know, enough. If you're on the golf tour and you have uh, $50 million a year in endorsements, you don't breathe a word of that. So it's very secret, actually. No, no that's fair enough. Um, so, Professor, um, in TRX, we refer to a lot of your studies, and uh, I was very curious um, when I first heard your name or you do, and um, you tested on pig spines. Is that correct? Is that how you sort of figure out a lot of the um, stuff about spine, human spine? 
Well, that's, that's a curious statement. I know there's people who go around and try and dismiss our work by saying, oh, McGill did their work on pig spines. And uh, I think that's either they don't know what we do uh, or they have an ulterior motive. About 10% of our work has used animal spines. Now think of every orthopedic condition and think of every disease. They all use animals and the reason is for scientific control. So if I could get 50 identical humans to donate their spines to me, I would have a controlled experiment. Unfortunately, I can't get that. So uh, if we can raise 50 pigs and uh, then do an experiment intervention on 25 of them and then the other 25 not, uh, and then we see what damage occurs or whatever the experiment happens to be. We learn something about a mechanism. So I can give you an example. Um, if you take a golfer, for example, they tend to have more slender spines and the discs in cross section are more ovoid. However, if you take a very strong, large framed man or woman and they're built for loads. So take a big rugby prop, for example, the chance of them having an ovoid sp spine is, is much less. They have a much thicker spine. Now, when you bend a spine or you, I'll back up to a principle now, if you bend a willow branch back and forth, it won't break. It can survive many, many repetitions of load. That's somewhat like the arch-typical golfer's spine. But if we take a thicker spine, whereas a golfer can twist, it can't take a lot of compressive load. It's not big and robust enough. Whereas the rugby prop has a bigger, thicker spine. But if you bend a thicker branch, it shatters right away because the stress distribution is a function of thickness and the radial distance. You get what I mean? Yeah. So... so, so we learned all that from pig spines. Now, I never would have learned that from humans. So that was a principle. Now we would learn what causes a disc herniation, what causes an end plate fracture, what causes a stress fracture, all on animal spines. And then, of course, we calibrate those up to applications on humans, which we don't get very many of. And if you get an, a cadaver of someone who's died of old age, you can't do an experiment on that because it would have zero representation of a robust fellow like you. So you're starting to see uh, you, you need animals, but then the trick is to calibrate it up very carefully for, for humans. So uh, people try and dismiss our work as, oh, McGill used pig spines. Well, yes, we did, but we also did the due diligence to take those mechanisms and then figure them out for a uh, human application. No, so it, it, does that help? No, it totally helps. And um, I like explain the whole situation. Not totally. And uh, as you said, like, I, I don't know how people that I guess get a little bit upset about it is, I'm not sure how you could do it any other different way. So thanks for that. Um, on spine health. So you just mentioned some spines are quite flexible. Some spines are rigid. Is that because, like, it, with with that in mind, is that why you're sort of not too keen on everyone doing sit-ups? Like, um, every answer needs a context. So you're giving me a very general question, and you know I'm not too keen on people doing sit-ups. Once again, that that needs a context. So if a person has a history of back pain, say they have a disc bulge, yep, doing sit-ups is probably not a wise choice. Now let's take uh, military groups around the world. So it's been traditional that the annual test of fitness, certainly in the US military branches, the Marines, the Navy, the Army, uh, oh, and the Air Force, and the Canadian military as well have used speed sit-ups in the fitness test. And there was some concern that training the test was causing back pain. I didn't say that. That came from the military, and then they came to me to, to get opinions, uh, um, et cetera. So there was several layers of experiments done. Uh, in one group, they stopped doing sit-ups altogether in basic training. But at the end of basic training, they still had to do the speed sit-up test. The groups that did not uh, train sit-ups, but they did 
core stabilizing types of exercises like the modified curl up, like stir the pot, rolling planks, etc. They had less back pain and they scored higher on the sit up tests. Now I'm going to take other examples where we've taken athletes who have to flex their spines and hips. So let's take a top marquee UFC combative athlete, mixed martial arts or uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu based uh, athlete. And they say, well, I have to do spine flexion movements and hip flexion, but they come to me and they are now out of the UFC. Their career is, is uh, uh, wasting away because they can't tolerate it anymore. So when you look at their training, they've been training sit-ups and whatnot, but they have zero capacity to train in the cage or roll jujitsu on the mat. So what we do is we take that pain triggering training approach and load away. And we uh, change that with, as I said, things like stir the pot and whatnot to wind down the pain mechanism. Now we have uh, their back training again uh, they have to limit the amount of rolling in full flexion, playing guard and whatnot, if we're using the jujitsu uh, example, but they use it, they get their timing down and they build a core of iron while they're doing it. They've never been so fit. Then when we measure Muay Thai fighters, and I'm not talking through my hat here, we've measured all of these in different groups. If you take uh, Muay Thai fighters as we did, and we measured hand strike force or punch force, and kicking. Well, uh, in order to kick, you have to create proximal stiffness, stop motion, and then snap the hips down to get the leg to fly. Um, if you bend your spine when the hips pulse, you lose transmission of power across the hip joint. You don't kick as hard. So if you want to punch harder and kick harder, use your hips and then spin around the uh, the trailing leg, as you know, and then at the end, the arm flashes out. So that mechanic required um, an actual stop twist and a stop flexion uh, stiffness to unleash the distal mobility. So distal speed and mobility and force production requires a good home base, proximal stiffness. You know, you can't fire a cannon out of a canoe. Yeah, but you can sure. fire it off a battleship. So you know all of this. You're a TRX trainer. That's These are <clears throat> some of the basic foundational tenets of uh, TRX and suspension training and whatnot. So, you know, again, I, I hear, oh, McGill hates sit-ups. Well, it, when it's disabling your uh, performance, yes, I do. Um, if that's what you do and you don't do a lot of strength training and you have a slender spine and you're going to compete in the, uh, Olympics as a gymnast. So you're not doing deadlifts, but you're handling your body weight. I might say, okay. So do you see McGill doesn't love or hate anything? It's, no, sure. it's, it's an issue that requires an intelligent conversation based and founded in science. And the science has to include Include the biology of the person, uh, the the rate of adaptation, their injury history, all of these things. So, these questions, I I, I know they they, they just get um, very simplistic on uh, Facebook and social media, and it's very difficult to even begin a conversation with a person who doesn't have mastery to talk at a level where you, you can set the limits, if you know what I mean, a little bit. No, that definitely makes sense. Um, you mentioned core stability, and uh, I think core, the term core gets a little bit confused in traditional fitness, um, and even, I think, public, general public. I'm not sure if they understand what a core actually is. Um, in a, like, I mean, how would a master describe, or what is, how would you define core? Yeah, well, first of all, I hate the word core. <laughs> Good. I just, I absolutely hate it. Um, however, it's a popular word that can begin a conversation with people, but it's always going to end up 
and, and with a little bit of controversy. So we need a definition. Um, I've already talked about this idea to get distal speed and athleticism, you had to create stiffness through the spine and torso. Now, it's no coincidence that the spine is not ball and socket joints. The discs are adaptable fabric. However, there's a ball and socket joint at either end, which is the hips and the shoulders. The only place we have ball and socket joints, but there's a design reason for that. If we had mobile ball and socket joints in the spine, you would need muscles this wide because a ball and socket joint is made for power, but it's a very unstable joint in terms of it needs a lot of stiffness for control. So a hip joint has a lot of muscle around it, but, uh, and, and a, a deep ball and socket design. But anyway, uh, so if I was going to define the core there, I would say it's a strategic continuum of stability and mobility to unleash the performance that's required at the moment. If I want to throw a javelin or hit a golf ball, now the whole discussion has changed. So that the uh, torso force has now decreased and we're going to elastic storage and recovery. Uh, of elastic energy. So we're snapping an elastic band to hit a golf ball. It's a, the, the discussion enti changes entirely. Now, if you're a bodybuilder and you're training for uh, appearance, the core is the six pack, <laughs> you know? So I, I, I guess I can uh, go, go on and on, but uh, in the pain world, um, if I can just show you a model here, just Please. a moment, I've got a full model, uh, repository on the wall here that we teach patients beautiful but um there let's assume this joint is normal and let's assume this joint down here is normal but this one has lost a bit of disc height because it's been damaged now i'm going to twist the person's spine do you see how the majority of the motion is occurring at the joint that's lost its stiffness yeah totally. so now to engineer out those micro movements <coughs> so excuse me if I performed an abdominal brace to a tuned level, not too much and not too little, I would suddenly be able to arrest those micro movements. Now, if I'm going to deadlift uh, 1,020 pounds, so say 450 kilo, that, that's a pretty good weight. I might have to activate my stabilizing musculature, the core, to probably 60 or maybe even 70% of maximum. But uh, if I'm just walking, if I'm gonna get off the stool and walk and uh, change my line of support between stance leg side to side, I might need a stiffening activation of 5%. So again, this whole idea of what's stiffness, what's core, you, you, you need a, a, a pretty ma masterful understanding of uh, how much is sufficient to just arrest the micro movement, take the person's pain away, um, but not too much because there's a compressive penalty for stiffening the core that way. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, again, we, we get into discussions of pain control or uh, performance enhancement. It's... Yes, it seems the, the body is like a, a sequence of switching it on, off, on, off, on, off. Like a, the, whole, the whole time there seems to be the rhythm, um, whether you're walking, running, throwing punches, throwing balls. Um, of course it is. That's yeah. great. Athletes are fabulous pulsers. Mm. So on yeah. that, um, I guess training core and a lot, of this, or, or, a lot of my audience will be a mixture of athletes and just, you know, moms and dads and, Unfortunately, this time of uh, when we're recording, a lot of people are sitting down a lot more than usual. Um, what would be some of the, I guess, the best and the worst ways to train your core? Let's start with positive. So what would be the best way to train your core? The answer is it depends. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> so uh, can I assume that we're training for function and not appearance? Every time in here. This podcast is all about function. Okay. So if we can go there, but you know, Marin out on the street and in the gyms, it isn't. Yeah. I understand most that. of the time it's about appearance. I understand. Um, however, uh, let's go to uh, adding 
pain-free resilience and enhancing ability. So if we define it with those two terms, um, we did many experiments over the years searching for the best exercises. So as you know, I've worked with uh, Chris Frankel from TRX on, on some of these and, and many, many people, Strong First, Pavel Satsulin, um, I mean, I, you can name a system uh, and I'll probably have spent time with the uh, originator. And what we were doing was looking for ways to train proximal stability, because that unleashes all distal athleticism, arrests micro movements from disc bulges or end plate damage or stressed ligaments or whatever they, they, it happens to be. And we kept coming up with what's called the big three. So you're familiar with the bird dog yep. and a form of it. And a very mild regressive form would be to simply raise one hand off the ground. And that's where some people who are very uh, fragile start. Um, and then the more robust people, we might have them drawing squares and uh, creating muscular pulsing. Uh, we might have them doing reverse rows with a TRX system. Uh, that would be a, an excellent progression for the back. And then for the side, the side plank is an outstanding lateral frontal plane uh, mechanical strength. Uh, well, it's a strength enhancer for sure, but endurance and everything else. And then um, for the front, the modified curl up where we place the hands under the low back to shape the curve to first of all, put it in its most resilient position, really build training capacity first. Um, but then, as I said, we may go to stir the pot. We may go to Roman chair exercises with knee raises or, you know, I have, I have no idea. Uh, the, 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 the exercise we choose, um, an exercise is simply a tool to get the job done. I want to choose the most efficient tool that spares the joint, but challenges the system that we want to challenge. It might be strength, it might be endurance, it might be stiffness, it might be stabilizing. I, I need a bit more context to answer that. No, for but sure. anyway, the, the big three is pretty much a foundation for both pain and adding resilience. And then depending on the specific person, uh, we will then build progressions uh, off of that. I'll put the uh, the links for those exercises as well for, in the show notes. Um, yeah. with with those with the big three, um, and like anything in fitness world or you know social media, um, we we find something good and we come almost abuse it. Uh, and what yes. I mean by that is, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, we're good with like that. Um, but what you know, what would be the and again, I know I know you're going to tell me it depends, but uh, the reps and time of each thing. So if I if someone's listening to this right now and they're like, right, I know what my big three is, how many reps or how much shall I be holding these planks for? And yeah, well, that's why I write books, Marin. Most <laughs> people choose and decide on these things because these aren't easy decisions. So if the person has pain we found the most productive way is the Russian descending pyramid. So I learned this system in Russia. Russians are very clever in uh, creating more endurance without getting tired. So, so think of that. The American way, the European way is you do long duration holds and many repetitions to create endurance. The Russians are more clever than that, uh, particularly for people who have pain. So we might do a 10 second hold of a bird dog and then they sweep the floor with their hand and knee and then go out again for another 10 seconds so in this way they build fatigue uh, fatigue resistance with repeated 10 second holds but they don't get fatigued to the point where they break form mm. when they break form that's when the pain starts to come so the person might start to cheat they might start to raise their leg a little bit too high now and they're turning their spine into whatever their pain mechanism. Say it's a sensitized facet joint, or they may have a disc bulge, or whatever the, 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 the uh, in original instigator that winds up their pain is. So <clears throat> there, there's a little bit of a, 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 a thought on the sets and reps, and then the descending pyramid, likewise, 
You might do four 10 second holds on each side in, in set one, three on the, on the second uh, set, and two reps on the third set. So it's a descending pyramid. Again, in that philosophy of building tolerable endurance without ever compromising form. But will that get you to the Olympics? No. So, you know, uh, then we, we start changing whatever, uh, load, endurance, uh, sorry, hold times. Uh, we might put in uh, dynamic exercise. Um, we'll, as as you, you're probably aware, we do a, a lot more neurological training with athletes than the typical trainer would ever think. No, no, definitely. I want to get into that as well. Um, who are the athletes with the strongest score? Who are the people that you've seen in your lab and clinic with the strongest score? Well, <laughs> you know how I'm going to answer that. <laughs> it, uh, it, it really depends. Um, if we just want brute core strength, I'm going to mention two people, and they know this, so I'm allowed to say their names. The strongest pound for pound core in the world that I've ever measured is Pavel Satsulin. Cool. He's the originator of Strong First and yep. the chairman. He's ungodly. So if we were into a little bit of a combative situation, he could do uh, you know, an arm drag and off that he would do a hip toss that would throw you across the room. He's not possible to hold during a strength calibration test. Uh, He's my size. He's about uh, six feet tall or uh, uh, what's that? 1.8 yeah. and uh, about 80 kilos. We're, we're pretty much identical and uh, absolute Hercules. He, he beats all the big 260 pound UFC guys, uh, et cetera. Now, the next person may or may not surprise you. And it was someone I met not that long ago, but a multi-year uh, timber sport champion. So these are lumberjacks who swing axes uh, from the side, cut down trees, chainsaw through logs and whatnot. That man had about the strongest uh, anti-rotational core you can imagine. But again, it is the hips that turn, creating the rotational power, and then boom, it's, it's a whip yep. uh, at the end. Now, if you were to look at... Uh, uh, Pavel doing a landmine exercise, for example, um, he pivots around his toes like this. So again, it's a stop twist kind of uh, exercise that has made him even stronger in torsional athleticism. And, and a lot of people don't get this. Mm. So if we were doing a TRX pull and then a reach back, the motion has to come through the hips, but it's buttressed through the core and then flexed into the shoulder. But if you just lock and, and, and fuse the shoulder and do it all through the spine, you will be weak and Pavel will throw you across the room like a rag doll. Um, but it's, it's the same if you're chopping a tree. If you want to do that with your spine, uh, you will get strong for about three months. Yeah, okay. And then the disc uh, collagen will start to delaminate. Um, but if you drive it with the hips and the shoulders and transfer the torsional power through the spine. Um, now, I've measured one of the few in the world who've measured the guys who hit really hard in the UFC. The guys who hit you the hardest are not the ones who turn their spines. Yeah. They're the ones who lock their spine and they snap their hips down around the stance hip and that leg comes around like a baseball bat and just about takes your head off. And, and you know, we have full uh, protective fight gear here. To be on the end of that is something to behold and how a man withstands that kind of uh, strike force without protective gear is beyond me. So uh, anyway, that's the athleticism. So, uh, and part of the myth of the core. <laughs> no, no, no. I love this. And, and you got me so excited because a lot of the athletes that I work with are water polo athletes, some MMA athletes, and tennis players. So a lot of those guys and girls are all about rotation. Um, and we just mentioned it before, Pavel, 
Uh, obviously, he's done a lot of kettlebell training in a landmine. It seems to be all anti-rotational stuff, even the power pull, T-Rex power pull. So would I be right or wrong in saying that for rotational athletes, resisting rotation or doing the exercises that resist rotation would be way more um, beneficial? And then layering on that with really healthy hip mobility or shoulder mobility as well. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail yeah. on the head. I've worked with some of the top tennis players in the world. And obviously, people come to me only because of back pain. There's no other reason. Yeah. And uh, usually, if I have a tour tennis player, that is the key in a nutshell. More hip power and more transference through a stiffer torso. So we train hip mobility and pulsing neurology onto a uh, stiffened torso. And you will find that you'll get... Here, I'll just give you a good example yeah, with a sure. tennis serve, for example. So let's consider the pec major, which flexes the arm around. So the pec major crosses the ball and socket joint at the top end of the core. Okay. Let's look at that muscle's action. Distal to the ball and socket joint, the distal end, it creates arm flexion. Agreed. Yep. Now that same muscle proximal to the ball and socket joint bends the rib cage towards the arm. That is an energy leak. So if I wanted to serve a tennis ball and all I did was bend my torso towards my arm, the racket won't move. Mm -hmm. I want to do 100% the opposite. So if I lock down proximal, use your word core, if you will, I don't care. So 100% of that muscle activation creates distal speed. So I've locked proximal. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, totally. That creates the fastest uh, serve miles per hour. So I remember a few years ago, I was uh, uh, <laughs> working and the uh, announcers said, oh, Venus Williams is uh, intimidating the opposition today. She's got a very loud grunt. And I thought, you're a fool. Um, what she is doing is putting more miles an hour on her tennis serve because the grunt mm, that super drives the intercostals and the three layers of the abdominal wall. When you mm, do that, it adds even more stiffness and you get even more stiffen through here so you get more distal velocity from those potentiated muscles so once again athletes grunt when they strike and serve and whatnot to add more proximal home base so you get even more power out from the uh, distally across the hips and the shoulders. And that's what propels the limbs, propels the arm, creates a whip, goes to the racket, and you get a few more miles an hour. And would that, would I be, again, a question, um, to create that uh, proximal stability or that um, the stiffness for that split second, um, should be we should be trained like that as well? Instead of holding, a, I guess, a, a two-hour plank or whatever, Three minute planks, doing more like stiffness and then well, relax. Yeah, that's what I was relax. saying with athletes. It's much more neural training than people realize. Yeah, and and, and I guess you know we the talk power breath is the strong first people like to call it, or breathing behind the shield, mm. or poo, poo, or it might be a uh, all of these techniques to create appropriate pulses through the linkage is how you create a superstar performance. That's amazing. Um, so a lot of athletes, and not just athletes, everyone's sitting down a lot. Um, and I know for water polo we've been talking about, you know, how do we keep those athletes moving or how do we keep them healthy? Um, what are some of the dangerous things, I guess, for athletes in terms of sitting down? Well, you know the answer. The answer is it depends. If the athlete has a specific pain history, a thorough assessment will show with great precision what the mechanism is. Then they uh, can employ the techniques of spine hygiene, as we call it. And these are movement hacks for athletes to move in a way that doesn't trigger their pain. They don't 
cause more pain sensitivity, they do the opposite. They wind the pain down. Now they just created more training resilience for probably some dry land training for water polo. They've got more power and speed in the water and uh, they may get more sitting resilience. Not that we want that. And that's a whole nother discussion. We can build training resilience in a person, but we don't want that. We want them not to sit anymore. We want that extra resilience to go to their training and athletic development. So it, it's, it's interesting. You know, we give the people these devices, ergonomic chairs and, and all of that, and they end up sitting even more, which has uh, uh, an unwanted deleterious effect. But uh, anyway, to answer your question in a nutshell, then uh, knowing their specific pain mechanism, we will then build a program of spine hygiene so they build more training tolerance. Yeah, no, that's good. good. Is, there, is there much connection between breath work and spine health and, and I guess power as well? Huge, yeah. But uh, again, we need a context. Yep. So I had a patient this morning, uh, as an example, who has uh, a fairly juicy disc herniation. Now, when the nucleus uh, comes through the delaminated collagen, the body antibody system, the immune system sees that as a foreign body and it sets up an immediate and massive inflammation. So around the spinal cord and nerve roots at that level, it sets up an inflammatory soup. Now you can see this in the person right away they move their head down like this, say, oh, that causes my back pain. My right foot goes on fire. And then they move their head the other way. Ah, oh. and then I say, okay, stand up. And they're standing with antalgia. And I say, pull your hips forward. And they go, ah, oh, they've got pain down their thigh. And then they uh, bring their uh, knee forward sitting in a chair and they get sciatic pain. So in other words, it doesn't matter whether you move the sciatic roots, the femoral roots, uh, the cord itself it's all going through this inflammatory soup that uh, everything is uh, causing just, just a horrible situation. What I did with him was breathing. So I got him to lay on his tummy with appropriate cushions and bolsters. And then uh, the mechanism of his disc bulge was flexion. So he'd spent too long on his knees, tiling a floor and, uh, uh, it just, it accumulated. And then all of a sudden a knife went into his back. This wasn't psychosocial. It wasn't anything like that. It was an acute disc attack uh, caused 100% by mechanics. So in order to release it, I got him to, uh, he was locked in flexion antalgia. Um, he laid on the pillows and then I said, breathe in. Now, as you exhale, surrender your back. Now I choose these words very, very carefully. My coaching cues, the words are very carefully chosen. Surrender. Let your low back as you exhale, restore some of the lordosis. Now I don't use words like that, but it's the word, the coaching cue that I need to achieve that. Surrender your low back, let it fall into the floor. Next breath, breathe in, exhale, surrender and relax your back. And uh, he was still getting caught a little bit. I said, okay, lower your head with, with neck flexion. Now turn your head a little bit and push your eyebrow one kilo down into the, into the floor. Bingo, it unleashed him. So I'm just romancing the breath and some of these uh, mechanical uh, things because I understand the inflammatory soup and the nerve tensions and that kind of thing. Well, what that does is it helps to vacuum in the disc bulge and then show them how to tall kneel, lunge up, stand, and all of a sudden he can pull his hips through and stand. And he says, wow, that's, you know, that's a 50% improvement. That's a 15% 50% improvement with three minutes of breathing doesn't have anything. To, well, it may have a little bit to do with psychological relaxation, but what it does do is, is it gives psychological empowerment. It shows him how to use breath work, not to, again, I think the psychology gets way overplayed on this. The psychology gives 
empowerment that, wow, I am in control, but it doesn't dismiss the role of posture. The mechanic that worked was 100% posture facilitated by breathing and the psychological benefits were secondary, but important nonetheless. So there's a, an example. Now the next athlete comes in and they have the micro movements that I was talking about like that, but they play in the NBA and their job is to box out one of the big seven foot uh, aggressive, you know, the real physical players under the basket. We teach them the opposite type of breathing. Quiet belly breathing will not work for them, nor is it transferable onto the MBA court. They have to create a shield. So they breathe behind the shield. They, they contract the, uh, the barrel, so to speak, to engineer out the stiffness. But they breathe, <laughs> creating a diaphragm athlete. So here we'll put them into a side bridge and they breathe through pursed lips. So there's your training exercise to really create tremendous diaphragmatic breathing. And uh, just one second, yeah, no sorry about that. No problems. That'll be my mother. It's, uh, she calls every night at this time. She's 91 years old and still spitting nails. But anyway, <laughs> um, so th th there's uh, uh, some examples. But, uh, you know, I, I think sometimes there's far too much emphasis on quiet breathing. But I gave you an example yeah. where it was perfect for the pain control and the empowerment that we needed. But then I'll see people doing breathing workshops with professional athletes. And I really wonder what the transference is. But now I'm going to argue with myself. There's a baseball team in the USA called the St. Louis Cardinals. They yes. won the pennant two or three years ago. So they were probably, uh, the, the, I, I love the Americans call it the World Series, but they don't invite the Japanese and all the rest yeah, of the world, sure. the Australians. But uh, nonetheless, um, it was probably the best team in the world. Well, we studied that team that year and the year before. And we measured the breathing patterns, the fitness, the strength, health profiles. We, did, we collected a lot of data on every player on that team, and we followed them for two years. Um, we got four back injuries over those two, two years. We can predict who got back injuries with 100% accuracy. And I will also tell you, the ones who didn't get injured, we predicted those with 100% accuracy as well. So the specificity was 100% in, in the study. There were three variables that went into our prediction. One was strategic core stability. I hate that word, but you know what I mean. Oh, thank you. The other one was motor control and hip mobility. So hip control and mobility. So once again, it's the rubric of proximal stiffness and stability and distal mobility. But the third one, you've probably guessed it, is quiet breathing mechanics. So I never would have predicted that in a million years. So that's what the science shows us in my little meander through a discussion of that topic. You know, I find really interesting and something that I've been kind of playing around with. It was more, um, more for recovery, I guess, getting people to breathe uh, before we start training and, and the thing in my head before I spoke to you was just to kind of reset everything, drop the anxiety and then we can focus on the job. But it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, like now that we're spending more time in the flexion in front of computers and everything else, a bit of light breathing before we do anything won't hurt. <laughs> Well, again, that depends. In my world of uh, building performance, there are times to be relaxed and then there's the time to create a warrior. Mm. And uh, if we're going to train, I'm brinking on fight or flight response. Yep. And I'm trying to create that and feed it. And the breathing will be very much a part of it. So uh, the worst thing for underperformance is to be emotionally flat mm. and belly breathing uh, when I, I, I want in certain situations to create the beast to unleash super strength, super speed. However, if the arousal is too great and the breathing is too uncontrolled, 
Now, uh, say you take a sprinter, for example, they can't relax because of sprint very much. See, when a muscle contracts, it does two things. It creates force and it creates stiffness. So you, you pulse your strength to be quick. Um, you know, I can tell you several stories of some top UFC fighters. And uh, when you get to know them after a while and, and spend time with them, they'll tell you the hardest part of their job is controlling the fear. The fear that comes from when they leave the dressing room, walk through the stadium and climb into that cage. That's one of the most loneliest things you can do, a man or woman can do in their lives. Very fearful. Now, if fear creates stiffness in their body and you throw a punch with some residual stiffness, you're going to the hospital very, very quickly. It's not like losing a tennis match. It's a very serious consequence. So the control of fear quite often is done with breathing drills, which is a foundation in martial arts, as you know. Mm. But uh, when they walk out to their selected music, uh, the breathing and the skipping, the looseness, it's all a strategy uh, to get the frame of mind where they have to control the rage, control the fear, but then they have to unleash it strategically. Do you know what I mean? No, no totally. Yeah, so the, the mental game of this is is huge. Absolutely. No, it's it's um it's something I'm really curious. I want to learn more and, about and, it. Oh, and and what you were you're saying, I I think I know uh, uh, the coach you're talking about that was telling uh, his athletes between rounds just to breathe, calm down, collect yourself. So there's a time to rein an athlete in, and there's a time to do the opposite you know, just unleash some rage. But anyway, uh, I'm, yeah, it, these are wonderful discussions. No, I love it. It's, uh, as a former athlete and someone that loves sport, I just, I, I, one of my favorite things, Stu, is to actually watch, um, not just what happens on the field, but what happens in a change room and what you spoke about before when athlete needs to walk from a change room to the cage or, you know, if, if an athlete has, um, in, in, in Australia, rugby league, for example, if, if an athlete makes a mistake and the opposition scores, what athlete does after and kind of behaviour um, change. A, a lot of athletes in Australia at the moment are like kind of really practising breath work in between halves, quarters, um, and I think it's a lot to do with anxiety plus recovery as well. So it's quite oh, interesting. You're a wise man because very few uh, strength coaches, people who enhance performance wouldn't, would be totally oblivious to what you just said. And yet it is so important and, uh, great coaches don't miss any of that. Yeah. Uh, that's why on, on teams, there are sports psychologists and, uh, you know, physiologists and mechanists and technique coaches great teams I, I i think of some of the great models in the world like ac milan a great soccer club in northern italy and the team that they have supporting the athletes is exactly what you are saying they have someone watching yeah. all the time the reactions and uh as soon as a player is psychologically beat watch their posture it gives it away every time mm. it goes into flexion head comes down get your head up let's you know <laughs> get some of that pride back and uh no pain optimal performance and show the world kind of thing well yeah, I mean, the russians are very good at this yeah totally no, I was yeah, gonna... the russians are very good at, at this whole game of posture and psychology and strength and well, will the posture, what, when you just mentioned that, one thing that I found fascinating was when uh, Conor McGregor fought Aldo in, 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 in a fight for his first belt. And, I mean, obviously, McGregor was relentless with the mental game before the fight. But Aldo, before the game, had his head down. Uh, he just didn't want to look Conor at all. And he lost the fight in, what, seven seconds or nine seconds. And just his posture just almost gave it away. Um, and even the... The stiffness you spoke about, that they, they, they analysed the fight and Aldo's right hand was just shaking and it was almost a trigger for Connor to throw his hook and he saw the shake in his, um, in his right hand. You're a student of the game. You're, <laughs> you're fabulous. There's a, a great uh, MMA analyst named Robin Black. Do, do you know Robin? Yeah, I think I'm following him on uh, Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Robin is very, very masterful. 
and uh, he doesn't miss a twitch, an yeah. eye twitch, and uh, the way he calls the, the color in the in the fights and uh, makes the observations that you're making now, only the 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 true uh, sport connoisseur and and scientist is is just so yeah. plugged into that. that. I yeah. love it. Good for you. Thank oh, you. You're an impressive guy. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Last question, um, <clears throat> and it's just again a bit of a selfish question because I'm curious about it. Um, me as an athlete, I used to um, uh, overtrain and under recover. I was I was a classic, um, so my recovery wasn't great. Um, so the recovery is something I really um, I'm uh, really fascinated. Again, it's like how do you improve someone's recovery? Recovery and sleep is one of those tools that we all need to work on and i was just curious with sleep and spine position um is there anything that we should be like thinking about or anything you aware of that like um that maybe we shouldn't be doing in our bed like um like I, I, the reason why i'm asking this i get a lot of clients to go that back sore and they go like i slept funny and it, to me it was always a really weird thing to say because i always thought sleep wasn't meant to hurt your back um, so do you have anything on sleep and posture, I guess? Oh, I've got lots to say about it. And, and the answer has to start with yet again, it depends. Okay. So what we're doing now is an exercise in pattern recognition. When a patient or an athlete comes in and I'll say, tell me about your pain patterns. And they say, well, I get up, getting out of bed is really tough. Uh, I have a lot of morning stiffness and it works out after an hour or so. And there's, 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 there's several possibilities there. Their mattress might be dead wrong. For example, a person built like you and me, um, in the sleep literature, we would be categorized as triangles, to, uh, broad uh, or, or more pointed uh, hips and yeah. shoulders, narrower waist, so that when we lay on the mattress, we've got pressure points under those high points. Um, so we would do, generally speaking, much better with a firmer mattress, but a very generous pillow top to take the edge off. But if you're what the literature calls a square, so these are b usually bigger, heavier men and women who sleep on their back, and quite typically they snore. It's all part of the pattern. They tend to do better in a memory foam. So they don't change position. They don't roll. They just sink into the foam and everything gets supported. But if you or I were on a memory foam, that wouldn't be good because with our body heat, we'd sink into the memory foam. And then when we wanted to roll and change posture, it's a lot of work to roll up out of the depression. You wake up. And now if you have joint instability, say you've got an ACL deficient knee or you've got a little joint stability in your lumbar spine, now you will get sharp pains in your back. So yes, when I roll over in bed, I get a sharp pain in my back or whatever. Good. That's the primary sign of joint instability in the spine. So do you see how we're looking for patterns totally. now to interpret them? Um, anyway, uh, someone might have a, a neck disorder where they turn their neck one way. Now, if they completely surrender and relax, the neck is unguarded. Yeah. And it is um, quite easy to sensitize uh, the, the tissues of the neck. Same with the disc bulge uh, in, in uh, some people, not all, but some. Say someone has a, a sacroiliac joint problem. All day long, they're under load, holding their pelvis together. They go to bed and they turn the wrong way without the stiffness. And uh, all of a sudden they say, ah, you know, I just cracked into pain. So th mm. these are... Uh, you know, Ooh. movement instabilities or movement catches and they, they happen in bed. So, you know, I might say to the, the person, if I suspect that, how many uh, pillows do you go to bed with? And they say, well, I've got one between my knees. I got one under my knees. I've got two under my head when I lay on my side and I've got a folded towel under my midsection. Sir, you have joint instability yeah. as a giveaway. <laughs> no, no this, is, this is great because something I think about, like, are we... There's so much more science about sleep, importance of sleep. Um, and, you know, we've got technology now to measure your sleep. There's Apple Watches, Roy Bands. But the one thing that hasn't really caught up to technology is, is mattress. Like, I feel like, you know, there's still not enough 
the, the, how fast technology moved with to measure your heart rate, HIV, and everything compared to a mattress that's you know perfect for your spine and everything else. And even if you go to a traditional shop, like the bloke in a shop, with all due respect to them, they wouldn't know stuff that you just no. mentioned to me. They wouldn't even ask us questions. Um, right. So that's why in my book, Back Mechanic, there's a whole section on choosing a mattress. No, so I'll, I'll, some I'll science to consume. And then at the bottom end, there's no substitute. You've got to go lay on it and yeah. just tell the salesman, I need an hour. Please don't disturb me. Yeah, for sure. And try it for an hour. And, and if you do it for 10 minutes, you'll never know and you'll end up buying the wrong mattress. Now, I'll put it in the a, in a, in a links for sure. Um, thank you very much. I won't hold you. I know it's getting late. It's probably dinner time. You've got to call your mom as well. Uh, so you don't <laughs> get in trouble. Um, no, she'll be in bed now. But where, where can people reach you? Like, I mean, what's the best place to reach you for my audience well, and athletes? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not a social media person. My, my attitude is either you're on social media or you do your job. You, 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 you know, you can't, sure. can't do both. But uh, having said that, we do have a website, backfitpro.com. Yep. And uh, my textbooks are on there, uh, videos, and our courses. We were just in Australia in, yeah, uh, I saw it actually. Uh, and we put on some courses in Sydney and uh, Melbourne and whatnot. But, um, th- th- w- you know, we've got podcasts there and articles and things like that. So that's for, as, as a resource to go to backfitpro.com. Now, apparently, my daughter, she runs uh, for us Instagram and Facebook. And, and my only instruction to her is it has to be content rich. Yeah, for sure. No, yeah. no, that's so. That's uh, uh, she. She runs that, but uh, go to the website is probably the best. Uh, no, I think, um, Stuart, like I, mean, I like to observe during this time, and you know, people are sitting down more, people are running more, and I think um, you're definitely a, a person to um, go check out. And I'll definitely send my audience towards you because obviously you got wealth of knowledge, and I, I hate to say it, but I think people will be experiencing a lot more back issues, back pain than before this pandemic started as well so um no i think you're probably right um thank you very much uh, i really appreciate it and I, I'll, I'll send uh i'll send my audience to to your um to your websites and your and okay, uh, thank you very much i'll be in touch and, i'll send uh, you before i hope, hope that helped you Marin. it was amazing um